So f of x is e to the 2x. And we're considering the second degree Taylor polynomial of f centered at zero. You should be able to calculate Taylor polynomials. That's a calculus two kind of question. Let's just confirm the answer first of all. So f of x is e to the 2x. f prime of x, we need to calculate the derivatives, right? Is 2e to the 2x. And f double prime of x is 4e to the 2x. The x zero is zero, so we need to plug in zero into these things. f of zero is e to the zero is one. f prime of zero is two e to the zero is two. And f double prime of zero is four e to the zero is four. So the second degree Taylor polynomial, call it p2 of x centered at zero, is gonna be, first of all, f of zero is one plus f prime of zero times x minus zero, which of course is just x, plus f double prime of zero, which is four divided by two factorial times x squared. And of course, two factorial is two, so this simplifies to one plus two x plus two x squared. So that's just confirming the answer for the Taylor polynomial of degree two. What about Taylor's theorem for any given value of x not equal to zero. Taylor's theorem guarantees the existence of a number C of X. And since X could be different, this really is a function of X as we saw last Thursday. Between zero and X, X by the way, doesn't have to be positive. It could be negative. Such that F of X is the Taylor polynomial P2 plus the remainder term. By the way, you can certainly define R2 of X. Whether it's got this formula or not, by just saying it's f of x minus p2, actual minus approximate, you could always define the error. What's special about Taylor's theorem is that the formula for the area error takes this form. It's the third derivative of the function evaluated as unknown number c of x divided by three factorial times x cubed. So let's go ahead and write well what that is in this context. So we need the third derivative, f triple prime of x is eight e to the two x. So f triple prime of x, well evaluated at an unspecified function c of x. Let's just go ahead and write out the whole remainder term here, divided by three factorial times x cubed. In that formula right there, just replace the x with the c of x. Uh, eight divided by three factorial, sorry, is gonna be eight divided by six is gonna be, scratch that out. It's gonna be four thirds e to the two times c of x times x squared. What did we do last Thursday? Last Thursday, we set this equal to f of x minus p2. In this case, e to the two x minus this thing would be minus one minus two x minus two x squared. And we solved for C of x. And we could do that here, actually. I could have made this part of the exam problem. You could solve for C of x here. You could divide both sides by x squared. You could multiply both sides by three fourths, then take the natural log of both sides, and then finally divide by two. C of x is gonna be one half natural log of an expression. So we could do that here, it's possible. But in general, so I was illustrating Taylor's theorem, in general, we don't know what C of X is and we maybe can't solve for it in general. But we do know it's between zero and X, whatever X happens to be. Question? Is the X squared supposed to be an X cubed? Yes, X cubed, thank you. In general, we're not gonna be able to solve for C of X, but to do this problem, you don't actually have to solve for C of X. The rest of the problem says, use this fact to find an upper bound on the absolute error, the absolute value of R2 of X in using P2 of X to approximate F of X over the interval from zero to 0 0.25. Again, no formula for C of X is necessary, though, again, we could find it here involving a logarithm. 
just use the fact that for any x between 0 and 0 0.25, xi of x must be in that same interval because it's between 0 and x. That's what the theorem guarantees. So how do you do that here? So the absolute value of R2 of X is going to be the absolute value of this expression right there. Absolute value of four thirds e to the two C of X times X cubed. Four thirds is positive. E to a power is positive. I can actually factor those out like this if I want to. X could be negative, and so therefore X cubed could be negative, but the absolute value of X cubed is the same as the absolute value of X quantity cubed. Though we are in the interval from zero to 0 0.25, so since X is in the interval from zero to 0 0.25, I actually can completely get rid of the absolute value sentence. If X were negative, I could not do that. So the question is now, over this interval, this same interval here, 0 to 0 0.25, what's the biggest this could possibly be? Well, 4 thirds a constant. X cubed is going to be biggest when X is the right endpoint there, 0 0.25. What about e to the 2 C of X? Even though you don't know what C of X is, what could we do here to finish this? We know e to the 2 X is an increasing function. Even though we don't know what C of X is, we do know it's between 0 and 0 0.25. This is still going to be maximized if C of X were 0.25, again, which it's probably not, I can say this is less than or equal to four thirds e to the two times 0.25 times 0.25 cubed. Whatever ha that happens to be, that's going to be a guaranteed upper bound on this error. It's an absolute error. Let's go ahead and figure out what that is. 4 divided by 3, 1.3 repeating. 2 times 0.25 is 0.5. So we got multiply times e to the 0.5 here. And then multiply times 0.25 to the third power, which is going to be 1 64th as a fraction, right? As a decimal, it would be uh, 0 0.01 something. This is about... 0 0.03435, if I want to go far enough to round up is what I was doing there. But we could certainly say that's also less than or equal to, say, 0 0.04. So this is saying over the interval from 0 to 0 0.25, the absolute error in using the second degree Taylor polynomial to approximate F over that interval is less than 0 0.04. Let's try to confirm that here. Graphically, f of x is e to the 2x. p2 of x is 1 plus 2x plus 2x squared. r2 of x, if I just type it in as f of x minus p2 of x, it can still be graphed. So let's plot. Well, let's plot just f of x and p2 of x first and see that they look close together. Yeah, they look pretty close together. And now let's plot, well, I can plot R2 of X. I could also plot its absolute value. Which function is higher here? I believe the uh, E to the two X is higher because it's concave up here and the third derivative is positive. Yeah, E to the two X is the upper one. That's the original function. Error is actual minus approximate. So the error here, R2 of X is actually positive. I don't need to take its absolute value. There it is. It never gets above 0 0.025 even. It's certainly less than or equal to 0 0.04. So the theorem gives you a guaranteed bound on the error. It's possible the error could be definitely less than that, maybe even by a significant amount. I didn't ask this on the old exam, but I could also ask how big should N be 
So the nth degree Taylor polynomial is within a certain error bound of the actual value. It's a little tricky here because the derivatives coefficient keeps going up. I'm going to have to look at that pattern to write down a general formula for the nth derivative. If we look at the pattern there, it looks like it's uh, two to the nth power times e to the two x. And that would also, by the way, mean the n plus first derivative, which we'll need with Taylor's theorem, is two to the n plus one times e to the two x. What would the bound on the nth degree Taylor approximation imply in this context? What is the absolute value of the remainder? Well, it's going to be the absolute value of the nth plus first derivative evaluated at x0, which is 0, divided by n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1. In our example that we just did, n was 2, and so that's why I had a 3 factorial and an x cubed here before. This is going to be, if x is still positive, I can get rid of all the absolute value signs. 2 to the n plus 1, e to the 2 times c of x over n plus 1 factorial times x to the n plus 1. Okay, go ahead and replace. I'm going to use fractions this time. Replace c of x with 1 fourth, right? Because c of x is between 0 and 0 0.25. 2 times 1 fourth is 1 half. Go ahead and replace x with one fourth, the biggest it can be. <clears throat> All right, this could be simplified some. You know, one fourth is one half squared. You could, uh, you'd have a one half to the two times n plus one, which you could partially cancel with the two n plus one. You could simplify it a bit. I'm not going to bother. Say we wanted to choose n so that this is less than, say, 0. 0.0001. How big should n be? This would be 10 to the what? 10 to the negative 3? Uh, 10, 100, 000, 10 to the negative 4. It's 10 to the negative 4 right there. I can make it even smaller. As far as doing this, uh, use technology. It's not something you can really algebraically solve for n here. Where did my Mathematica go? Just use technology, calculator, to figure out how n big n should be to make that true. We could make a table of values, for example, of 2 to the n plus 1 times e to the negative to the 1 half divided by n plus 1 factorial times one fourth to the n plus one, numerically approximate it, let n go from one to 10 is probably good enough. Yeah, by the time we get to this one, we're already less than 10 to the negative four. And what is that? N is one here, then two, then three, then four, then five. N is five is good enough. <clears throat> So for after an approximation at least that good to e to the 2x over the interval from 0 to 0 0.25, use a Taylor polynomial of at least degree 5 is the point. On a test, if you only had a calculator, that would take some experimentation. Maybe I'd have to give you a hint or something. I don't know. Or if I let you use Mathematic on the next test, uh, you could do this kind of thing. Table just gives you values of whatever this is, whatever this is actually, over a range of values of n. And you can see I went up to n equals 10. n equals 10 would be good enough to guarantee we're within 10 to the negative 10. Good enough for calculator approximation. Does that mean cal calculators use Taylor polynomials to approximate functions? Not necessarily. We're going to start learning about Lagrange interpolation today, and that is in general better because we're after whole intervals. 
Though in, in truth, it could be some kind of combination. I never programmed a calculator before, so I'm not positive. But it is all based on arithmetic operations. These are polynomials, so we only are using additions, subtractions, multiplications, and divisions. And you can certainly make circuit boards that do basic addition and multiplication. So that's kind of a hint about how you can use electronics to do advanced math. Isn't that kind of cool?